Thank you. Great introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. I, uh, first of all, I want to thank the administrator for uh, letting me come and take just a couple of minutes to set up what I think will be a terrific panel headed up by Ray Suarez and with some extraordinarily wide-ranging uh, views to share. I am going to use a couple of slides. I know, uh, generally speaking, people look and see a, a military guy from the Pentagon with a PowerPoint presentation, and that's created a fair amount of problems around the world. Uh, <laughs> I assure you this is a very easy presentation to get through, and I'll do this in about 10 minutes. But I do like to use a couple of images. And as I was saying to my very good friend, Raj Shah, there is, there is no part of the government in which the images, frankly, are more evocative than in the world of development. And so what I'll do today is just show you some of the challenges of thinking about development in a conflictual situation. And then I'll try and talk a little about some of the what I hope are relatively creative ways we're thinking about it at the Department of Defense. So if I could have the first image. This is Libya, which uh, many of the people in this room were involved in. And I would offer this as an example of attempting to do humanitarian work, trending toward development in a zone of actual open, well-known conflict. Very, very difficult. As many of the practitioners here know, we saw about uh, one million refugees in this situation, in camps in Tunis and Egypt, Niger, Mali, and going to the north, to Italy and to Spain, as well as to France and Greece. So uh, about one person in seven in Libya becomes a refugee, is in need of international assistance, and yet we are in the midst of a very active combat campaign, very difficult. Next, please. This is Somalia. This is a drought-stricken region. Uh, as the administrator knows, probably one to two million people will probably die as a result of the drought and the famine here. This is a second kind of situation because in addition to the natural disaster here, and I could have shown the tsunami, uh, I could have shown the earthquake in Pakistan, I could have shown the earthquake in Haiti that Raj knows so well. I chose Somalia because there is also in the background uh, an insurgency, Al-Shabaab is the general name for it, and it, it contributes again to the extraordinary difficulty of conducting these vital compassion missions with a backdrop of conflict and combat, here compounded by a natural disaster, in this case, a drought. I also chose a drought because as we look, as this century unfolds, uh, the challenges of water and water management, I think, are significant and sadly will lead to conflict in other places. And so I think as we look at this idea of how we do development in regions that are stricken, uh, this is another example of the challenge before the group that's assembled here today. Next, please. This, of course, is Afghanistan, which is very much uh, a place where I am engaged today, where we have the NATO alliance, 28 nations, as well as 22 other nations with troops on the ground, and a total of 70 nations who are engaged in one level or another with development. Here we see not only the complexity of the, the desperate needs of development, but we also see a very virulent insurgency compounded by this image, which of course is poppy. This is narcotics. So we add to this mix of challenges uh, yet another dimension that we saw, for example, as well in Colombia. So, I offer these three images to sort of set the stage for what we all know, which is the extraordinary difficulty of doing the strategic mission of development that you are executing with the tactical work that we're trying to do to create some level of security so you can do your work. And your work is what, in the end, will determine success or failure in these places, and we get that. We want to support you. And if there's a single message I have for you today, it's the importance of 
defense as trying to support development and diplomacy where we can. Next, please. So I also think a lot about these two images. Upper left are young boys and girls who are receiving aid. Bottom right is uh, a child soldier. This is a supply chain that we, we cannot allow to connect both from a security perspective, from a humanitarian perspective, from a sociological development perspective. Um, our goal is to support your efforts to make sure those two images don't connect. And we heard a lot from the heads of state and government about the youth and the importance of youth. And I would underline it with this particular image. So next, please. What are we trying to do about it? Let me give you some ideas that we're working on in the Department of the Defense. And, and the first one may or may not surprise you a bit. It's the idea of studying and learning languages and understanding the culture of these places in which we go to work. We take our example in this regard from AID, from the Department of State, from our diplomats and our developers. We're not very good at this in the Department of Defense. Only 8% of the Department of Defense speaks a second language, for example. I've chosen to put here the Rosetta Stone. We are working hard on this. We want to increase our ability to understand and to uh, be able to communicate both directly and also to understand the culture, the history, the literature, all of the salient aspects of the cultures, because if we can do that, then we can far more effectively support you in your work. Next, please. We're also doing some fairly creative things as we work with local security forces. Now, these are Afghan soldiers. And you should look at this photograph and you should say, well, that's an odd photo because they're all holding books. And if you know anything about Afghanistan, you know that sadly, the literacy rate in this demographic, 20 to 30, is very low. It's only about 15 to 20 percent because the Taliban withheld education throughout this demographic's opportunity to learn. So you should say, so why are Afghan soldiers all holding books? And the answer is because we are teaching them to read. We NATO, we the NATO training mission Afghanistan, We've taught 200,000 Afghan soldiers and policemen to read. Now, they're not going to go write a, a novel like Marcel Proust, but they are functionally literate. They are hungry for this knowledge. When you are a, a man or a woman in Afghanistan and you can read, you put a pen in your pocket. And when the graduates of the reading course, again, 200,000 so far, about 70,000 in classes now, when they graduate, we give them a pen to put in their pocket. That is an extraordinary moment to watch a young Afghan man or woman take that pen as a symbol of literacy. Now, we are also teaching them to fight. That's our job. But we have to take a broader, more comprehensive approach to try and create security, and this is an example of it. Next, please. Another way in which our security sector is trying to be helpful to di diplomacy and development is the use of hospital ships. I could talk quite a long time about this. This was from my three years as the commander of Southern Command. I was uh, stationed in Miami, and I was focused on military-to-military -military relations throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. Comfort sails around the Caribbean and the Pacific. Uh, she does patient treatments, about 400,000 every time she goes on a voyage. We coordinate all this. We work very hard to support the AID programs. We work very hard to support State Department programs. Uh, this young boy was photographed in Nicaragua in uh, in. Corinto, anybody remember that from the 1980s? Now it's an American hospital ship there. Daniel Ortega said, the Americans come now with ships of peace. Now that's an extraordinary statement from a, a Latin American leader, particularly in Nicaragua. This young boy came with his mother. They walked three days to come to an eye clinic. He was very nearsighted. They put the vision 
goggles on him, and for the first time, he looked around and he said, Mama veo el mundo. Mom, I see the world. That delivers security. Now, that's a, a terrific story about a real human moment, but in the end, it has a pragmatic effect, which is to help deliver security by demonstrating compassion and competence, along with the capability to conduct more traditional military operations. Next, please. And this is a view of the world according to Twitter. If you look closely, you will see purple lines, which are tweets. The density, the darker the purple. You'll see green lines, which are geolocations of Twitter users. The white is the synthesis of those two. It is, in effect, the points of intersection between the social network and the physical world. I show it to you, first of all, it's an interesting way to look at the world and regions that are developed in this sense and less developed. And I would make the point that from a military perspective in areas that are less developed, we can help. We can support through infrastructure, logistics, information. We have the ability to reach into those spaces. And secondly, all of us, as we work together on development, diplomacy, and defense. We need to be in these social networks. It's terrific to publish articles in the journal of nobody actually reads it, and I've published a few of those. But to exist, to move a message in the world today, you have to be in these social networks. Largest nations in the world, China, India, Facebook, the United States, Twitter, Indonesia. So. We need to move better and connect in this world as well. And we're trying to do that in partnership with all of you. Next, please. So this is a, a busy slide, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but it wraps up this approach that I'm discussing, which is if you look on the outside, and of course, this slide is geared to Afghanistan. If you look on the outside, you see the flags of the nations that are represented there today doing development, defense, and diplomacy in Afghanistan. Inside that, you see the logos of international organizations that are engaged. Appropriately at the top, the United Nations, European Union, you see NATO over there. You see then the interagencies, the cabinet level organizations like AID, DFID, and others that are doing such extraordinary work there. And you see the private sector. I would argue that we've kind of got it on international. We understand interagency. The big thing we have to be working, and I'm, I, again, we heard a lot of it from the heads of state and government here. I see it all the time with the way Raj is moving AID. It's private public. It's making that connection. And we're working on our approach to that in ways that we hope will be supportive of what is done by you in the lead in the development community. We, call, we have a name for this. We call this the comprehensive approach. It's a doctrinal term today in NATO, and it simply means international, interagency, private, public, bringing it together. Next, please. So that's the idea. I mean, this is the image we want to create. We don't always succeed. We fail. We cause civilian casualties. We are reducing those radically today in Afghanistan, and yet we just had a terrible incident last week. But civilian casualties in the first four months of this year are down almost 50%, those caused by the coalition. 85% uh, of the civilian casualties are caused by the insurgency, only 15%. One is too many. This, again, is the picture we strive for. We don't always achieve it. But in the end, we can achieve this if we lend our support to the efforts of the development community. We really believe that and understand it. Next, please. So last image. You know, life is not an on and off switch. I think we all know this. Uh, you know this in your own lives. You kind of have to dial it in a little bit. And I would argue that uh, your military, your defense establishment is not an on and off switch. What I mean by that is we don't simply go in 
to barracks or go off and do all-out combat. We have a lot of capability that's in the middle, in logistics, in information, in medical, in all the things I've talked about and we can talk about on the panel. So I think the idea is not hard power or just soft power. It's finding that dial and setting it right so that we can support the development community as you do in the end what will cause the strategic success that will move us forward as a planet. And that, I think, is your charge and our job is to try and support you where we can in these theaters of conflict. And I hope we have a chance to talk about that on the panel. With that, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Thanks a lot.